Thank you so much for inviting me to Amsterdam. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. The weather, of course, here in Amsterdam is just as lovely as it is in London, so it feels like coming home. What I want to do today is talk you through some of the trends in the global consulting market. But just by way of introduction, um, I'm the founder and director of a specialist company. We research the consulting industry across the world. We're based in London, but our job is to do this, to be out in the undergrowth of the consulting industry, to be talking to people, listening to people, watching what's going on. Some of the people we speak to are consulting firms. Many of them are clients. So we do a great deal of listening to clients about what they would like to see from consultants and how the consulting industry may change what they would like to see changed about it. Indeed, my favorite question of a client is always, if you were advising a consultant, if we turn the tables, what would you say? And it's something I'll come back to at the end. So what I want to do this morning is talk you through three things. I want to look at recent performance in the marketplace. So what's going up, what's coming down. We heard a lot, for those of you who were, who were in this room, about the difficulties of um, emerging from a financial crisis and how not all the consulting markets have yet recovered from that. So I want to look a little bit at recent performance. I want to look at how clients' views about consulting firms may reshape our industry. And I want then to look specifically at the challenges that has for smaller and medium-sized firms. Much of the research we do is done with um, and, and about the very big firms. So I want to use that last section to make it as relevant to those people in the audience who are running smaller firms or who are indeed independent consultants. But let me step back. Let me start with the world of consulting and what that looks like today. So we've spent the last two years building up a very intricate, detailed model of the consulting industry, which is based on working out how many consultants a firm has in a particular country, delivering a particular service focused on a particular industry. And we then work out metrics about how much they're likely to be earning their business, and we aggregate all of that to give us a global picture. Now, our, we can't do that for every single consulting firm. So the numbers that we use are for firms that have 50 consultants and above. So what we describe as big consulting. But I think you'll see that many of the trends apply to smaller firms as well. Um, if we aggregate all that, we get a consulting industry in the world today which is worth about $115 billion. Um, it grew in 2014 by about 9%, but that growth is distributed very differently across the world. So let me take you on a very rapid tour, not really of 87 countries, because we'd be here all day, but the major markets that we can see. So let me start close to home with Europe. Now, Europe has taken a longer time than the US to recover from the financial crisis. Some markets didn't suffer particularly. If we look at Germany, and there we're looking at Germany, you can just see 6% growth in the German market. That's been pretty steady for the last few years, and Germany was the fastest recovering market in Europe, driven largely by, by clients who were already very international. One of the themes that emerged in the last few years is that if you want to grow as a consulting firm, you've got to grow working for companies who are international, whose fortunes are not tied to one country and one set of customers, but they themselves can be flexible and find new market opportunities. And if they can do that, then they can grow and you can grow with them. So the German market grew very strongly and has continued growing. At the moment, though, the fastest growth is in the UK, um, so we've put there 7%. Probably this year, more likely to be 10 or 11%. Very fast growth now. Probably making it the most attractive consulting market in Europe. But the UK has slower to recover. So we're seeing a different stage in the economic cycle. What we know happens at the end of a recession in consulting is that having been flat for a while, you then get a period of fast growth. 
because there's lots of projects that people have put on hold. There are lots of initiatives they would like to have invested in that they haven't. And at the point where business confidence returns and the market starts to improve, you get this very quick surge in activity. And that's what the UK has. I'm not suggesting the UK market will continue to grow at 7 or 8 or 10%. It'll slow down. It'll do kind of that. But we're seeing that period of really rapid growth. That picture is about to be true if we look at Spain, France, and the Benelux region. Partic the, each of those countries has different issues. So the Spanish market probably contracted by about 30% during the financial crisis. But Spanish firms endured by exporting. Many of them moved to South America. Many of them found different markets for their services. It's taken a long time, but the Spanish market has now just started to turn the corner. Italy, by contrast, was slower to go into a crisis and actually is probably now starting to contract. It was flat, and it's just starting to come down. France, another market that's taken a long time to recover, longer than the UK. It's just started, we said 2% in 2014, maybe 5% in 2015. We hope there'll be a surge of activity in France as well. But the French economy is still not very confident. There are very structural reasons why people are not so comfortable using consultants there. So recovery may be a bit slower. So what about the Netherlands and, and the Benelux region? This has been contracting in the last few years. Um, partly as a switch away from big companies to independent consultants. And we already heard this morning there are specific regulatory and, and kind of regime issues that make being an independent consultant in Holland particularly attractive. But we've also seen big companies move out of the region. So they've moved their head office away to other countries. And that's taken with them the buying of consulting. Consulting is usually bought in the head office country. There are exceptions to that. But if we see a company moving many of its head office functions to another country, to an emerging market, for example, then some of the buying of consulting in the original home country goes down. And that's really affected the Netherlands in the last few years. But here, too, we've seen an improvement really in the last six to eight months. Um, just talking to a handful of people before my talk, it's clear that I think many of you are seeing that, too. There's a recovery, but only just, <coughs> only in the last few months. The good news there is that there is a lot of pent-up demand, I think. So there will be an increase in activity in the Netherlands, and the market here should be good for the next couple of years. But that migration of head offices out of the Netherlands means that it's going to be a tough market going forwards. It's not an easy market to operate in. So that's the European picture. Many of you come from, um, from outside, uh, kind of from further afield. Let me just, I know there are many of you from Russia. So our numbers here say 12, a drop of 12% in the Russian market in 2014. Probably further contraction in 2015. A lot of that contraction, though, is felt by Western consulting firms who have bases in Russia. And I think one thing we're seeing here is a switch away from those companies to local Russian providers. So I'm hoping that those of you who've bra been brave enough to come to Amsterdam on a wet day will be having businesses that are doing better than our numbers there. And what if we go even further afield to look at different countries? Well, it's a bit of a mixed picture. The fastest growing market, in, large market in the world is the Gulf region. So we put together there the Gulf Cooperation Council, which is the United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Bahrain, and of course, Saudi Arabia. That market's growing by about 15%. Actually, that growth rate came down slightly. It was 20%, which is extraordinarily high. So why is that market growing so fast? Well, it's a very simple combination of factors. There are clients there with a lot of things to do, a lot of profits to spend. So there are a lot of agendas to work through. And a tremendous shortage of highly qualified people to help them do this. So the real issue there is a lot to do 
and not many local people able to do it. Clients themselves are bringing in people from all over the world to help the process, and consulting firms are there. And almost the unique advantage of consulting firms in the region is that they've been able to bring in people more quickly than clients can do themselves. But a lot of work and not many people doing the work has created a real desire, a real kind of boom for consultants. Go to other emerging markets, though, and you do see a more mixed picture. So um, India, the growth rate there has been much lower than was predicted four or five years ago, mostly to do with political change. The hope that the Indian government, being more business friendly, will deregulate and create opportunities is there, but it's not yet happened very much. So the increase in consulting that could be out there has yet to happen. If you want to find tremendous growth rates, maybe 35% or 40%, then you have to go to Africa. But Africa as a whole is a much slower growing market than you might expect. 75% of consulting in Africa comes from South Africa. And that market, again, due to economic reasons, is growing at maybe 2 to 3%. So there's not a lot of growth going on in 75% of the African market. In North Africa, a lot of political turmoil and upheaval means that opportunities there aren't being realized. And that leaves us with places like Nigeria and Kenya. And these are the markets that have been growing at 30 to 40%, but they're tiny. There may be $150 million is the total size of the consulting market in Nigeria. So it really puts it in perspective that you can get huge growth rates, but it's a very small market. And collectively, these are places that it's not easy to be a consultant. If your clients are worrying about basic things like whether their, gener whether their power is going to be on through the day, then some of the higher level things about organizational change and governance and risk and regulation, they matter less to them. So it's a hard market to operate in. Uh, we've got a big group of people here from China. So the Chinese market, the growth rates there, we think, have been are still positive, but they are lower than they were in previous years. Our sense, and in fact, we've just finished um, writing a report about the Chinese consulting market and interviewing many firms based there, is that this is a market in transition. Historically, the great growth rates came from Western companies who wanted to expand, and they brought consulting with them. That, over the last few years, has transitioned to much more work being done for state-owned enterprises and private companies in China. But actually, that transition isn't necessarily straightforward. And there are many things you're not... People are buying in a different way. People are concerned about, being, about procuring too big projects because of the anti-corruption drive that's there. There's a lot of demand for new thinking and innovation. But we're, as I said, in transition from different sets of clients to a new group who are perhaps not as familiar with buying consulting. So lots of opportunity, maybe a sort of slower growth environment for the next couple of years, and then becoming perhaps the fastest growing market in the world three or four years from now. That leaves us with the Americas. Well, Brazil. Brazil is by far the biggest consulting market in America, in South America. Um, it's always been positioned as the great growth opportunity, but Brazilians have a wonderful phrase for it. They talk about chicken flights and that their economy is a chicken flight. Chickens, of course, don't fly. So the chicken that fly, the flight is the chicken that goes and falls down and falls down. And this is the Brazilian economy. It's also the Brazilian <coughs> consulting market. It keeps looking as though it will take off and comes crashing down. There are opportunities in Chile, in Argentina. People are talking a lot about um, Colombia. Um, Mexico at the moment, but again, these are very small markets with big percentage increases, but are not necessarily easy ones to, to go to. So that leaves us finally, but perhaps most importantly, with the US. So the US market really defies expectations. Um, of my $115 billion market, about 45% of it, globally, 45% comes from the US. So it's a tremendously big, homogeneous consulting market. 
things happen in the US that you can't get to happen in Europe because it's one giant market. But a market that's that big and that mature should be growing quite slowly. That's what we learn from economists. But it's not been. It grew by 9% last year, 8% the year before that, 7% the year before that. The growth rate is actually increasing in the US. And to give you a feel of what that feels like, it means that the US consulting market, just the additional growth in that market every two years, is the equivalent of the entire German consulting market. So it's as though in America you added a Germany every other year because there's such a big market and it's growing so quickly. So how can this be? How can a market that's so big and so mature be actually one of the fastest growing markets in the world? It comes down to three factors. The first is the strength of the US economy. The US economy, for all the fact it, you could argue, pulled us into the crisis with the subprime mortgage scandal, was by far the earliest Western economy to emerge from it, very, very strongly. Consulting goes with economic growth. We don't find, generally, consulting firms growing where the economies are not growing. So the fact that the US grew quickly meant that consulting grew quickly. Another factor is the willingness of US corporations and organizations to use consultants. Unlike France, or to a certain extent Germany, there is no reluctance associated with consulting. There's no shame in bringing consultants in. It's simply part of business. It's perfectly good sense to not recruit more people, but use consultants to fill in the gaps in your organization. We might argue that's not really consulting, but from a client point of view, they're not distinguishing between the two. They're using consultants in the US to help them get things done, and whether we want to call it consulting or contracting, they don't care. Consultants are playing a fundamental role in implementation in that market. The third factor in the US, and this is something I'll be coming back to, is around technology. Nine out of 10 clients that we talk to in the US are either engaged or planning to launch widespread transformation programs that are heavily based around technology, and particularly new digital technology. US clients believe the power of technology to fix things. French clients don't necessarily. German clients, Chinese clients we speak to, don't necessarily believe that technology is the only solution. US clients have a slight tendency to do that. They believe that they can solve things through technology, and that drives consulting. So three reasons why the US has defied expectations. And at the moment, although you could say, well, the economy there, maybe will, the growth will slow, maybe firms will start to recruit, so two of those drivers will go away, that third driver about technology, and particularly about digital transformation, is what's really now fueling growth there. So it's by far the biggest boom market we've had in consulting for 15 years. So if we ask clients what's driving their use of consultants, right across the world we hear the same things, although in different markets the balance between them may be slightly different. <coughs> Nobody has taken their eye away from costs. Even in that booming US market, people are still concerned about how to keep costs under control. That idea of simplification is hugely appealing. How can they get rid of complexity in their business? How can they improve productivity? They know, as we know, that the next financial crisis is probably only a few years away. So they can't afford to let the costs rise up. They have to keep them under control. But we can't just focus on costs. People have also got to grow. One of the most formative interviews I've done in the last couple of years was with a big pharmaceutical company. And I was speaking to the strategy director. And you'll know from talking to your own clients, sometimes when you're talking to somebody and you're tapping away or I'm tapping away on my laptop, you know they're telling you what they think they want you to hear 
And when you close your laptop, when you're about to walk out of the door, that's the point they tell you something really important. So there I was in one of the big pharmaceutical companies, and this director said, I was just about to leave the room, he said, you know what really is going on here? It's that we don't know how to grow. We understand about generics and blockbusters. We understand about new innovators coming through. But we don't know where the market opportunities are going to be. We thought they were going to be in emerging markets, and we've got some growth there. But we are sitting around at our board meeting, and no one wants to talk about the elephant in the room, which is we don't know where growth will come from. <coughs> and I think that problem happens elsewhere too. And it's one of the things that clients talk most about when we say what's driving your activity and your mental energy is where do we grow? Where do we go to grow? We've been to every country. We've launched every product. What is there left for us to do? And they're looking to consultants to help them do that. Where are the new sources of growth? Where are the new markets? What could they do better to raise their top line as well as control their bottom line? But they're not doing that in a free environment. We're used to the idea of risk and regulation in financial services, but risk is something that has now got a much broader picture to it. Risk around the resilience of your supply chain. If you're a consumer products company, you, are you buying from a factory in an emerging market where people are working in conditions that are unsafe? How do you know that some crisis that you've got won't blow up into a major issue that destroys your reputation as a business. We're also seeing regulation affect more parts of the world as well, and they're turning to consultants more and more to help with risk and compliance. Join all those together, and you've got an almost impossible world for a client. A client who has to keep their cost under control, somehow has to grow, and somehow has to be compliant with new regulation they may not fully understand. So how can they do all of that? Well, that tells us why people are looking at technology. Technology becomes the solution here. It becomes the way in which you can square the circle, make things possible when you're just incredibly busy. So it's not surprising that it feels a bit like it did before the year 2000. So back then, and I was still interviewing people in consulting firms and clients that, at that time, now we hear people say things like, my chief executive says we need a digital strategy. I don't know what a digital strategy is, but we have a budget for one and we have to get one. <laughs> and this particular person was building very large scale trucks. And you think, what is digital in the context of heavy manufacturing and engineering? Of course there is a role for digital there. But people are working on this. They're trying to find opportunities. This is the solution. It's the, the magic wand. It's the silver bullet that people are looking at, which means that we've probably got a bubble forming around it. Some of these big projects will not deliver what we expect. Some of them probably will do. And actually, one of the challenges at the moment is to make sure that the consulting industry supports that and helps people deliver it but doesn't overinflate the bubble, which of course is what happened around the dot-com boom. Underlying all of this is a picture of clients who are phenomenally busy. So we ask people every year, what are the activities that are going to drive your business and you, you as a person in the next 12 to 18 months? And they're things about cost cutting and regulation. If we add all of those things up, we get a simple index about activity, about how busy people are. And that's the blue dots you can see here. So if we take all of the thousands and thousands of people that we speak to and survey, then you get a picture that says, in 2013, 72% of organizations were doing one or more of the initiatives that we listed. Today, it's 84%. So people are doing or planning to do more than they were. And that would be fine, but it wouldn't help consultants if they're not also willing to use consultants. So what the green dots represent is the proportion of organizations who expect that this activity will increase their use of consultants. And you can see that's also risen from 45% two years ago 
to 54% today. So clients, your clients, are not only busier, but they are more willing than they were two years ago to call on you for your help. Because they're so busy, they can't do everything. They need consultants more than ever. Very simply put, if we then ask people how they think their expenditure on consulting will change, then the proportion of people or organisations is twice today what it was two years ago who say it will increase. So two years ago, about a third of clients said their expenditure on consultants was likely to increase. Today, looking broadly across the world, it's somewhere between 65 and 70% of organisations. You'll still encounter organisations that are trying to cut back. Everyone has their own cycle of consulting. But this is an industry which twice as many organisations today think that they will be spending more on consultants than was true two years ago. So although it's hard to predict the future in consulting, and of course anybody who does this is going to get some things wrong, at the moment, looking at the data that we have, 2015 will be a boom year for consultants when we get to the end of it. There is no sign of that boom period globally finishing in 2016. So we're seeing strong growth across the world in 2016. 2017 maybe starts to slow a bit. And of course, perhaps by that point, we've got to the next financial crisis. <laughs> you never go for too long without a crisis. But I think next year, the year afterwards, these are, this is a good time to be a consultant. You will see your clients spending more, investing more, relying on you more than ever. So the English phrase would be, make hay while the sun shines. Exploit the market opportunities while they're out there. So that's my picture of the state of consulting. So why then do I want to go on and talk about how client demand is reshaping things? Because at the end of any period of, of change, we embark on a new period of change. There's no stopping change in any industry, let alone in consulting. And when we ask clients often, how, you know, how do they use consultants? That's always our first question. How do you use consultants? Increasingly, what we hear is we use consultants in two ways. And I liken it to a piece of string. My, I like to call this my string theory. So those of you who are physicists might recognize the parallel. My colleagues call it my rope trick. But it's a piece of string. Imagine for a moment that consulting is a piece of string. At the one, ha one side of our piece of string, we've got consulting, which essentially is low-cost consulting. It's work that people look at and don't want to pay a huge amount for. At the other end, we've got something that I'm going to call high-value consulting. Not necessarily high cost, but certainly high value. So it's a spectrum. Now that spectrum has always been there to some degree, but I think there are some things that are changing at the moment. First thing is that what defines something as being low cost is familiarity. At various stages already this morning, we've touched on the need for innovation and how, in some markets, lack of innovation is holding the market back. The clients we speak to will say, we have a certain type of work that we give consultants, which we would do ourselves. We have the capability to do it, but we lack the capacity. We lack the time to do it. So we're going to bring in consultants to help with that area. But there are many firms out there who can do this, so the choice is wide, and therefore we're not going to pay over the odds for this kind of work. It's going to be a low-cost market. At the other end, we've got people saying, this is an issue that we don't understand. We are not familiar with this particular area, and we don't know which kinds of consulting firms to use to help us in the market. Because it's unfamiliar, we want people who are going to work with us, who are very experienced people, who are probably very senior people, who can bring new ideas, new thinking, new data, new knowledge. So innovation is the core part to that. 
Now, the thing that clients go on to say is that having thought through where well, we've got low, low cost and high value, they say, well, maybe these are two different consulting markets. Maybe we haven't got one consulting market, we've got two. We've got a low cost market and a high value market. And actually, that's why my, skin, my, my string is fraying in the middle. It feels a bit like clients are pulling it apart and saying, two markets. Firm, a firm working in the low-cost space is not necessarily a firm they'll use in the high-value space. The two are mutually exclusive. And I think this adds up into a whole new ballgame, a different kind of consulting industry. And I think this is what's driving, and we talked just earlier this morning about different business models, this is what's driving that debate. The market is splitting. But it's not splitting in ways that you'd expect. So first of all, this is not simply a market that's got high value advice and low cost implementation. There are some types of implementation that fall in the high value space. Around digital, for example, really fast development of stuff, agile working, this is high value. But there are types of advice which are low cost, due diligence. I'd argue quite a lot of corporate strategy work is low cost. Vast areas of HR and change consulting are in the low cost space because there hasn't been much innovation there. If there'd been more innovation, it would be in the high value part because clients are really interested in it, but there hasn't been, so clients see it as a commodity. As I've said, clients say these two things are mutually exclusive. They want to go for one firm, firm A, for low cost work, but they'll go to firm B for the high value work, which means firms need to rethink their business models. Traditional consulting doesn't fall neatly into my two parts of the market. You can't say technology is in the low cost space because digital technology is in the high value space. Nor can you say that, um, you can, nor, nor can you say that strategy consulting is high value. Some aspects of strategy consulting are low cost. So this division of the market cuts across traditional ways in which firms have organized themselves. And finally, a lot of consulting firms have been focused for the last 10 years on being more efficient. They've found ways to offshore their businesses, to cut costs, to deliver services at a lower price. In other words, their strategy has been focused on the low cost part of the market. And it's like one of those apocryphal um, big ships that's sailing towards a destination that are very hard to turn around. So the big ship, ship of consulting is heading towards an island that's labelled low-cost consulting. But clients, having been through the financial crisis, being very busy, wanting to use consultants to do different things, have now built another island over there, which is called high-value consulting. And they're saying, hey, come over here because we've got opportunities. But the big ship of consulting can't move around that fast. So what, what are people doing? Well, they're breaking up their businesses. One of the big themes of the last year, and I think will continue in the next few years, is we move away from the idea of one firm, one big firm, to get many, many smaller firms. It might be separate firms. It might just be separate brands. It might be radically different business models. But we're seeing firms look at their business and saying, we can't be in both areas. So you end up with some firms who are in the commodity space. Some firms will be in the high value part. I think you get some firms who will try and cover both aspects, winning large scale projects that combine both the commodity end and the high value end. But that's going to be a very, very difficult model to do because clients will continuously be saying, no, two markets, two businesses, two ways of working. And that's why I reckon it takes me nine minutes in any meeting I have with a leadership team of a consulting firm across the world, just nine minutes from when I start talking to when somebody asks a question about business models. 
It's a really important issue, and we're right to be looking at some of the innovation and innovative new ideas today. But it's been driven by a market that's splitting, with clients saying two different models. How can one firm do both? How do you operate in this different world? So I want to take, take back, step back from that and say, well, how does that work if you're, as many of you in the room are, running very specialised businesses, real experts in your particular field? How does all that big consulting stuff apply to you? Well, I think there's some bad news and some good news. I have a teenage son, and I know when I, he'll walk in through the door and he'll say, Mum, and he always knows I want the bad news first. Mum, I've got bad news and good news. So I've got, for you lot, I've got bad news and I've got good news. Okay? The bad news is that this thing I keep talking about to do with business transformation. Small firms don't win big business transformation projects. They can't. They're too small. We hear a lot of clients saying how much they'd like to use small firms because of the specialist expertise that you bring. But they can't give the work to you because the work is too big. It's going to cover multiple geographies, involve hundreds of people with different types of technology, doing all kinds of different things. They need multidisciplinary projects, bringing in different experts. They can't even imagine all of those different experts at one stage. So they inevitably go back to the big firms. And it's one of the reasons why, if we look at very big firms versus medium-sized firms, the very big firms are growing much faster because they're winning these big projects. Between a third and two-thirds of all the growth in consulting comes in the form of business transformation projects. So there are still small projects, but sm many small projects are being wrapped up into single big projects. So that's the bad news. The bad news is a lot of the growth is in big projects, which if you're an independent consultant or a very small specialist firm, you cannot hope to win. They are projects that will be taken from you before you even know they exist by a firm that the client thinks has got the scale and diversity of resources to deliver it. But this is a complicated graph to show something very simple. <laughs> this is simply taking and expressing as a rank from 1 to about 15, 15 different firms in different services and showing that if you're a client, you know, how does a, firm's, how does a client's view about a firm's strength of quality vary from service to service? And I put it up here not to start saying, oh, and this one here is Deloitte and that one's McKinsey. I put it to show you that clients get very confused. It's the noise on the line. Clients, we, we think that the consulting industry is hard to segment. Clients don't. Clients think it's extremely easy. They say there are three areas of consulting. Expensive, quite expensive, and cheap. And you're somewhere in that picture. But they, particularly when they're looking at business transformation projects, who do they use? How do they bring somebody in? Who is different? Who is good at doing this? There's a lot of noise on the line for them. So one of the key things they face is how to translate a big brand which is all about scale and security, into precise specialization, real depth of expertise. All of their clients see this noise on the line. They have another problem, which I think will be to your advantage, which is around quality and value. What this chart shows you is comparing, um, I have to look, my glasses aren't working properly here, but there we go. On the, on the, right, the left-hand side for you, quality, and on the right-hand side, value. Um, on the left-hand side, also the blue line is people who we call them indirect clients. They're your prospects. They're people that don't know a firm well. And the orange, orange bar are, are your clients, people who know you very well. So what you can see is that where quality of work is concerned, the people who know you well think you do a fabulous job. People who know you less well don't think so highly. They're pleasantly surprised when they work with you, they're a bit suspicious beforehand. And that pattern is true right across the world in all forms of consulting. Clients are a little bit cautious, a little bit sceptical, 
But once you've worked with them, then they think that was great. That was a really good experience. But it goes the other way around. And my numbers here look purely at really big firms. If you look at value, a client of a big firm, before they've used the firm, thinks the firm's going to add a lot of value. They have a really high expectation of what that's going to be, and it's disappointed. Is it disappointed because people are not adding value? Well, maybe. Maybe they're also not articulating what that value is. But from a client point of view, what they're seeing is lots of firms they feel they have to work with. That's the business transformation side. But actually, they can't distinguish who are experts. When, we, when they work with them, the quality is good, but the value being delivered isn't so good. So underneath all of this, there's a bit of a crisis going on about big firms. So, very briefly, there's a fairy tale in English that might exist in other cultures called Goldilocks and the Three Bears. The little girl who walks through the forest, she gets to a house, she gets in there, there are three chairs for the three bears. A hard chair, a soft chair, and a chair that's just right. There are three beds, one's just right. There are three bowls of cereal, one's too hot, one's too cold, and one's just right. That phrase, just right, is extremely resonant in the English language because it's all about just right. And I have a theory about consulting. I have a theory that I think applies to everybody in this room, which is that we think that clients, when they look at big consulting firms, say, too hot. We get the brand, we get the scale, we get the surety of what we're getting, but actually we also get a factory, a way of doing things that doesn't give us value and we don't understand its expertise. They would like to use people who've got real in-depth experience, but the problem here is that many of these firms are too small or they're independent consultants, so how can they get that expertise? They also think that small firms are far better in terms of client service. The ethos of being able to really work with your client gets lost in bigger organisations. We're used to, in consulting, thinking that you've either got to have a big brand or you've got to be specialised. But when we really listen to clients, actually neither of those work. The brands deliver something, but not everything. The small firms deliver other things, but not everything. Actually, there's a space in the middle, in my view, which is just right. And this is what clients tell us, that they want to work with firms that combine the really in-depth expertise of a smaller firm and the kind of international know-how, not necessarily coverage, but experience of bigger firms and, I think, some technology expertise. And they want to put that together into a firm which is, like Goldilocks, just right. <coughs> so how can you do that? Well, I think, fundamentally, from where you're sitting, the challenge here is about collaboration. Collaboration never works in consulting when the market is contracting. You're too busy fighting with each other over where the opportunities are. But the market for the next two years is buoyant, we think. So that leaves opportunities, I think, to really collaborate. And collaborate in different ways. Clearly, I think, to win more of this work, there needs to be more international collaboration. It's one reason why I was delighted to accept this invitation today, because you're bringing people from around the world who can work together and do what clients want. I think there's therefore collaboration between you. There's collaboration between those of you in smaller firms and those of you in bigger firms to build a better type of consulting firm, which for clients will be just right. So let me leave you with a picture of a market that's going to grow with huge opportunities, but fundamentally is changing shape in terms of the types of firms that will succeed. There are some that are too hot, some too cold, but the opportunity here will be to build firms through collaboration, which are just right. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Okay.